Welcome to the secret of making plotting easier. I think it's safe to say that we all want to be able to develop exciting plots, exciting stories that our readers can't put down. We want to be able to look out at the 30 to 60 scenes that we need to write, and that's the average number in the typical novel. We want to be able to look down that path and feel confident that we are going to be able to come up with what comes next. We're going to be able to develop all of those. And we want to do this uh, uh, repeatedly. We want to do this reliably. We want to do this on purpose, not on accident, right? Because we want to be able to do this novel after novel after novel after novel. The problem is it's sometimes difficult figuring out how we get that done. And if you're like a lot of new writers, you might have tons of great ideas for character and tons of great ideas for setting and the magic. You might even have some plot elements. But for some reason, you can't put them all together. You start your story and it runs into a dead end or it runs into a tangle or it runs out of gas. And you just can't seem to get those 30, 40, 50, 60 scenes. Now, I know how you're feeling. If that's you, I know how you feel. Not too many years ago, I was this far, this this close to giving up on writing altogether. In fact, I, I had already given up. I had won a Writers of the Future contest. I won a first prize, and they flew me out to Cocoa Beach, Florida, and I had a week-long workshop with professional editors and a professional, well, and professional authors. I got to see the Space Shuttle launch. They paid me $2,000. It was awesome. We had a workshop, and in that workshop, we wrote a short story, and we got to the end of it, and the pro editor said, hey, you know, and I, I wasn't very satisfied with the story, and the pro editor said, hey, you know, it lacks drama. Now, at the time, I had no idea what he's talking about. Drama? Drama. I, I don't even know what I lack, right? I don't even know what this drama thing is that I like. But I but I went home from the workshop and I said, that's okay, I'll figure it out. I finished another story, and then I couldn't finish another story for that next year. And then a second year, and then a third year, and then a fourth year, and a fifth year. Now, at the end of five years, if you can't figure out a story, figure, can't, can't actually write another story that you, you feel happy about, can't even get one done, you begin to think, Maybe I'm not cut out for this. Maybe I was a one-trick pony. Maybe I don't have the DNA, or I don't have the personality type, or I don't have the gift. Whatever that is, John Brown ain't got it, right? That's what I was thinking. And then I saw that Orson Card was holding a boot camp in Orem. And so I begged my wife, hey, can we, I take the tax money, please? And she said yes. And I, I, I got a slot in his boot camp. I flew out to Utah, and, and I... And I started, right? And the first two days was general instruction. And then on Wednesday, we were supposed to write a short story. And so I got up early Wednesday morning, right? And I worked, 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 worked. And then I had lunch and I worked through lunch and I worked in the afternoon and then I worked in the evening and I worked at night. And I didn't have a story. I had tons of ideas, tons of great ideas about character and setting and, and the magic and all sorts of other things. But I didn't have a story. I didn't have plot. And that comment that that the teacher had made to me came back into my mind, you know, hey, uh, lacks drama. And I thought, that, no, no, I'm putting that away. I've been putting that away. That isn't what has been holding me back. Something else has been holding me back, right? And I'm going to do this. And so we were supposed to turn it on Wednesday. And I thought, I, I can get it in tomorrow, man. I know I can get this done. I can get it in tomorrow. So Thursday morning, I get up early and I work during Thursday morning break and Thursday lunch and Thursday afternoon break and afterwards in the evening. And I got nothing. It's now Thursday night and I got nothing. And I'm at this golden corral that's at the top of the uh, top of the road above Utah Valley University. And I'm in there pushing my food around my plate and I'm realizing the handwriting's on the wall. Whatever it is the DNA, the personality, whatever, whatever that is, John Brown just ain't got it. And I've been pursuing this thing. You know, I took all of these creative writing classes in college. I've been pursuing this thing for more than a decade, and I just couldn't seem to figure it out. So it obviously had to be me, right? Obviously had to be me. So there I was pushing my food around my plate, 
And it was kind of a sad moment, right? Oh man, this dream has just died. This dream has just died. And, uh, and I thought I'm going to give my writing books away to my writing friends. I'm going to get rid of the manuscripts and I'll just never look back because you can be happy and not write, right? You can be happy and not write. And, and as I was sitting there, I thought, you know what, before I give it all up, and I wasn't going to leave the boot camp. I was going to finish a story. It would be another one of these stories that lacked drama. I'd finish it, and they'd give me their comments, and then I'd just be like, I'm done, right? I'm done. But before I did that, I thought, you know what? I'm going to try one other thing. I'm just going to try this thing. And I tried that thing. And suddenly, the lights turned on. The music started playing. And my story rolled out in front of me like a red carpet. It was just boom, 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 boom. Scene, 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 scene. And I was electric, right? I gathered up my stuff. I ran out. There was another boot camper in the line. I'm like, I got it, I got it, I got it. And I ran out to the car, zoomed to the hotel, and I wrote, 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 wrote. All Thursday night, Thursday night late, right? Got up early morning Friday, wrote during the breaks, wrote during lunch, wrote during the afternoon break. Uh, Friday night, I was just writing as fast as I could, trying to get this thing done before the boot camp was over. And Saturday morning, you know, I, I printed out, brought it in, and everybody was like, oh, man, <laughs> another 7,000-word story on the last day. Are you kidding me? But they came back, almost all of them smiles. When the workshop was done on that story, Card said, you know, these comments are like paint spots on a palace. And I about swooned out of my seat. Uh, who doesn't want that from somebody like Orson Card? Okay. And so uh, then that story after the boot camp, I revised it a little bit. And then it went on to sell. And then sell again. And then sell again. And then sold audio rights. And it got included in two best of the years and uh, year anthologies. A uh, uh, very short time after that, I finished my novel, got an agent, got a three-book deal with Tor Books. I've it's since then, right, sold tens of thousands of copies of my stories all across the world. Just this week, just this week, I, re uh, I released a collaboration between me and New York Times bestselling author Larry Correa. Bain Books published it, right? And I would have missed all of that. I would have missed all of that if I hadn't done this one little thing. So, so what was it? Was it that I suddenly got new DNA? Is there something going on with the chicken at, at Golden Corral? Did I suddenly acquire a new personality type? Well, the answer is no. It was none of those things. It was none of that. A door had been opened to help me suddenly see what story was about. This door had been opened. And I walked through that door with the little bit that I had seen when I first walked through it, wrote that story, and then I continued to learn those things. Until now, uh, uh, I, I, we've got a good framework for how story works. And that's what this presentation is about for you. It's about opening that door for you and giving you that framework so that you can make plotting easier. So let's get to it. I call it the John Brown Story Framework. And here's where it starts. What is a story? Now, you might think this is a rudimentary question. It's a stupid question, but it's not. Everything else flows from this. And if you don't get this right, you don't get anything right. What is a story? A specific answer should be tripping off your tongue. And if it's not the answer I'm going to give you here in just a second, then you know where you need to start. Okay? What is a story? Now, somebody might say, well, it's a character with a goal, and they're you know, trying to achieve the goal, and they have some obstacles. And I'll say to that, no, no, that isn't a story. And somebody else might say, well, it's a character in a setting with a plot. No, that's not a story. Saying that's a story is like saying uh, butter and sugar and flour is a cake. It's just, it just isn't, right? That isn't a story. So, and sometimes when I ask this question, there are people that have read E.M. Forrester and they'll be like, okay, uh, uh, the king died and then the queen died is a story. And then the king died and the queen died of grief is a plot. And then at that point, we all kind of blink like deer in the headlights. Huh? What are you talking about? That's not a story. That is not a story. What is a story? Now, if you don't know what this is, if you don't know what the answer to this is, it's like being in a huge room. And you got a thousand mechanical parts, and you don't know if you're building an airplane, a submarine, or a go-kart. It's critical. 
It's how you decide whether or not your story is any good. Okay? What is a story? Let me ask the question in a different way. Why do you stay up late at night reading, especially when you know you've got to get up? Why do you stand in line for a big old fat book and you plunk down 30 bucks for that book? And then maybe you spend $1,000, $1,500 a year on books. Maybe you're always in the library spending hours and hours and hours of your life with these books. Why do you do that? Why do you sequester yourself in the bathroom, sitting on the tub, getting a weird bum, reading these books? What is it? Now, when I ask the question that way, a lot of people start saying, well, we, we get different answers, right? Well, we do it because of the things that it makes us feel. We do it because of the experience. And there's your answer, okay? There's your answer. A story is a guided experience. That is what people are paying you for. That is what they're coming to get. They're not coming to get character setting and plot. They're not coming to get obstacles. They're not coming to get three, four, five, seven, nine acts. That is not what they're coming to get. They are coming to get a guided experience. It's very much like the roller coasters or the different rides that you find in an amusement park, okay? There's a certain type of experience, and, and the different rides have different types of experiences. And so I want you to think about genre at this point, okay? A story is a guided experience. And the first thing you got to understand as a writer are what are the key aspects of that experience? And again, it's you got to think genre. Because you can't think that a romance is going to be the exact same experience as a horror story, right? They're two different experiences, two different rides. What are those experiences? That's your first task. That is your first task. And I'll just make an aside. You know, with with there are other industries that give an experience. McDonald's is one of those. A hamburger, eating a hamburger is a certain type of experience. And McDonald's wants that experience to be the exact same time after time after time. It doesn't matter if you eat a hamburger in Orem or Seattle or somewhere out in Missouri. doesn't matter. They want the exact same experience. And that's what you expect from it. Our business is a little bit different. It's the same type of experience, but it can't be the same exact experience. That would be the same exact story. We'd be reading the same novel over and over and over again. Well, that isn't what we want, but we want the same type of experience, but something that's a little bit different. So the same, but different. That's what you're going for. What is that experience? Well, there are a number of things in it, but I'm going to give you a head start. And this is the second part of the, of the framework. Okay. A core part of this experience, and it is so core that it determines where you start, where you stop, and what happens in between. That's how fundamental it is. It isn't everything that you experience, but it's a core part of it. And it's what I call trigger, build, and deliver. Trigger, build, and deliver. Uh, there, are, In the past, I've called it trigger, delay, deliver, or trigger, tease, deliver. But I, I think I like build the best. Trigger, build, deliver. What are we triggering? What are we building? What are we delivering? Well, there are three things, three main things. Now, again, this doesn't, this doesn't comprise all of the experiences you're going to have in a story in a certain genre. But boy, it's core. It's fundamental. Okay? Here are the three things we trigger. Hopes and fears for the character. Hopes and fears for the character is the first one. Anticipation for something dramatic to occur or to hear about that dramatic thing. And then the last thing is mystery. I want to trigger some curiosity in a mystery. I'm going to trigger those things, and then I'm going to build them to a point, and then I'm going to deliver. So I'm going to trigger the hopes and fears for the character. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to build that to a very sharp point in the reader, and then I'm going to give them the delivery right of their hopes in a way that they didn't expect. I'm going to trigger the anticipation for something dramatic, and then I'm going to deliver that dramatic thing, hopefully in a way that's just a little bit different than they expect. I'm going to trigger this mystery, this curiosity. I'm going to make it weirder and weirder and more and more puzzling and confounding. I'm going to build that to a sharp point, and then I'm going to deliver the insight. Now, uh, this is much like, you know, another, here's another industry, right? Sports. This is much like a sports game. And the very, very best sports games, the very best games, the ones that you stand up and cheer and you're like, oh my gosh, those were, that was amazing, right? 
whether that's the Olympics or football or basketball or whatever. It triggers these hopes and fears. You have this anticipation of the game. Not so much mystery, right? But it does trigger hopes and fears for your team and anticipation. It builds it, and then you have delivery. There are surprises along the way. There are disappointments. There are setbacks. But I want you to think about those tremendous games, the ones where you stand up and cheer at the end, right? And we're doing something very, very similar. So uh, let me just talk about uh, these for just a second, hopes and fears. So I want you to imagine there was a movie that was about this. It was awesome. I enjoyed it with my daughter. Uh, there's a surfer girl. She's in a very secluded lagoon or part of the beach in Hawaii, and she's surfing, loves it. She goes out there and, and way out there in this little lagoon or bay, I guess it isn't a lagoon, but it's kind of a part of the beach. Out there in the distance is this rock and it's the tide's a little bit lower and, and she gets out there and while she's on the rock, she notices that there's this uh, whale that's dead over here and there's this massive, huge white shark. And when she tries to get off the rock and paddle in, it triggers that thing to come over and and uh, try to get her because it's trying to protect its its me. Suddenly we have hopes and fears for this girl. She's got to go back to the rock and then we find out the tide's rising. The tide is rising, which means at some point in time, she's not going to have this rock to hide on from the shark. Okay, Triggers hopes and fears. Now, are we anticipating some drama? You, you bet. And I want to help you with this. I don't want to leave you like I was left with. What, what the heck is drama? When, when I talk about dramatic things, you're anticipating something dramatic. This is what I'm talking about, right? It's something juicy and tantalizing, something that you want to be the fly on the wall to see. So it's things that are extraordinary or surprising or dangerous or devastating, or it might be humorous, or it could be tender and romantic and lots of conflict or puzzling. All of these types of things. It's anything where you'd say, oh, man, I have to see it, right? M Madge has been working at this company, taking crap from her boss for a long time. And finally, you see, you're sitting there and Madge says, she reads some email and she said, that's it. That's it. And she gets up and she marches towards the, uh, the, boss's, the boss's office. And everybody in the office, you know, everybody in the office is going to be like, oh, my gosh, <laughs> what's Madge going to do, right? we got to watch that. It's like that. It's anything like that. It's like being going down the freeway, and all of a sudden you see smoke and a tire come rolling by the other way, and some dude runs across the road, and there are lights, and everybody that is in that area is going to be riveted on that, those types of things that you want to look at. They don't always have to be um, that physically dramatic. They might be, there might be other things, like a guy and a girl, and will he hold, will he, will he hold her hand, right? Whatever it is that we're like, oh, my gosh, I want to watch that. That's what we're talking about, okay? That's what we're talking about. Okay, so now the question is, so I've got, I gotta have, uh, uh, the story is a guided experience. Okay, I got that. And I know that a core part of this experience, so core that it determines the beginning, where it begins, where it ends, and everything in between, right? Or, or a lot of the stuff in between. So core is trigger, build, deliver. And I know that I'm triggering hopes and fears for the character, anticipation for something dramatic, and this curiosity and this mystery. Okay, I know I've got to have that. How do I trigger it? Right? That, that's the next question. How do I trigger it? Well, there are a number of different ways to trigger and build and deliver, but I'm going to talk to you about the very initial thing that you as a writer have got to set up. And this is going to make your plotting so much easier. When you have this, it just goes clickety-clickety-click. Yeah, you run into snags and some, some difficult spots, but boy, the, the, uh, the plotting is so much easier. When you don't have it, you run out of gas, you run into dead ends, you just meander off and you're like, I, I have no idea. And in fact, when you don't have this in a, in a book or a movie or a TV show, that's when people say, when is this story going to start? Okay? And it all revolves around the story setup. And I like to think of this as the engine. You've got this car that you're going to take these people in a ride, right? You're going to put them in and take them in a ride in this car. And this is the engine. This is the thing that's going to get that car moving. So what is it? Well, here it is. It's got five parts. The first thing is genre. You want to know what genre is. We already talked about this, but let me just give you another example. Let's say you got a story that's set in World War II. And if I tell you it's a horror story, 
your mind immediately begins to run in that direction. If I say it's a romance, it's going to run in a different direction. If I say if it's, it's a military action thriller, well, it's going to run in yet a third direction. Having that genre affects everything that's coming next in this story setup. It tells you the kind of characters and the situations, the obstacles, etc. So you want to have that genre when you're developing the story as soon as you can. And then we have a compelling character. Now, people that are super competent or powerful or good looking or humorous or quirky, there are a number of things that make characters compelling. This is one of the things you need to learn as a new author, right? Uh, but you need to have a compelling character. And then a Tom comes into that character's life. Now, what's a Tom? That stands for threat, hardship, opportunity, mystery. It can be one of those or some combination. You don't have to have a threat, hardship, opportunity, and mystery. You can have a threat and a mystery or just a threat or just a mystery or whatever it is, but it's got to be some form of a Tom, okay? That Tom comes into the character's life, and then the character sets a concrete goal. It's not just any concrete goal. If if you're on a on a pleasure island or a entertainment island, an amusement island, and they got all these dinosaurs, and then the velociraptors get out, you're not going to be setting a goal about playing the violin or something like that. You know, that's backstory. That's maybe what you were wanting to do before this story. But this story is about the Tom. And so you set a concrete goal to eliminate the threat or escape the hardship, or seize the opportunity, or solve the mystery. That's what you're doing, okay? That's what your character's doing. And I, I notice that it says concrete goal. It doesn't, it doesn't just say, uh, um, you know, eliminate the threat. Our minds, your mind as a, as a, as a writer, and, as a, and the minds of the readers, we are all keyed into specifics. We don't get a lot of creative ideas when we're up in the abstract. When we get into the specifics, that's when the ideas start to flow. And so this is a concrete goal. With the velociraptors, it isn't, hey, I want to eliminate the threat. It's, I need to escape these velociraptors, and I need to get to the dock at this side of the island. All right? If it's a murder mystery, let's say that there's a, the body of a dead woman that's found at the bottom of a, uh, or underneath a bridge, and she's missing a shoe, and... We're like, oh my gosh, right? Well, we've got a mystery that's been introduced, maybe a threat, and our goal is going to be, I want to solve the mystery and find whoever the killer is so that we can stop them from killing other people, bring them to justice, for the woman that's under the bridge that's missing a shoe off of one foot. It's that specific, okay? We're going to have a very concrete goal. And then this is the last piece. This is the secret sauce. Because if I don't have this, I really don't trigger hopes and fears for the character. I really don't trigger any anticipation. Let me give you an example of this. Frodo and Gandalf are sitting in Frodo's house next to the fire, and Gandalf has, has the ring and says, here, Frodo, take it. You know, his mind is bent on it. All his thoughts are about the ring. You must destroy it. And Frodo says, yes, Gandalf. And he scampers out of the house and across the road and tosses it into the blacksmith's forge. And the ring melts, right? And thousands of miles away, there's there's this cry, ah, and the Black Tower falls. Are you going to pay me $9.99 for that book? Are you going to pay me 30 bucks for that book? No, because it didn't deliver the experience that uh, that you come to these stories to have delivered. It doesn't It doesn't trigger hopes and fears, really, or an anticipation for something dramatic. We get this little, this little initial trigger, and then it's immediately resolved. Well, you need to have formidable obstacles. Think about your 30, 40, 50, 60 scenes, right, in a typical novel. You're not going to get 30, 40, 50, 60 scenes without obstacles in the way of the character achieving that goal. Okay? This is the story setup. This is the engine. Let's look at some examples so you can see how this works. Uh, back in 2016... I saw some ads, and and on one of them was this wonderful woman, Roxy Hurlbert. She's the co-owner of Mercer's Dairy. I saw her and immediately found her compelling. Now, you might not find her compelling. That's fine. You follow your zing, I'll follow mine. That's what we do as writers. But to me, she was dynamite, right? A competent woman. Look at that face, right? She's lived, she's thought, and she can do things. And I was just enamored with this woman as a character. 
And so let's put her into the story. Let's put her into a story setup. So here it is, and you don't have to write it this way when you're developing, just as long as, but I like having these categories because I can free sketch what I'm going to do in each one of these, each one of these slots. So this one's going to be an action thriller. And we've got uh, this female, Roxy. This is our compelling character. She's in her 60s. She's gun-toting, tractor-driving, horse-riding, tough-as-nails, widow rancher. She loves spending time with her little cowgirl, this 10-year-old granddaughter. Okay? Do you, do you like her? I love her already. I, I love this woman already. Do I have a story? No. Have I triggered anything? No. Just some interest in her as a character, but that isn't what we pay people, or that isn't what people pay us for. So... She she's there at her kitchen sink, maybe making pies with Julie, her granddaughter, and she gets a call that a neighbor's dog is mauled. Yet another one of her calves, or maybe she even sees it out of the the window, right? And she glasses it, and she's like, "Yeah, that's the third calf, right, in the last two weeks." So she's going to go over to demand the dog be put down, and instead she interrupts a drug dealer, and his goons murdering the neighbor for punishment. And they come after her. Have we got a Tom? Have we got a threat, a hardship, opportunity or mystery or some combination of that? You bet. There's a threat. There's a little bit of a mystery, right? She's now going to formulate a goal. I need to escape these murderers. Very specific, related completely, tied directly to the Tom. And what are the formidable obstacles? She doesn't have a phone. She's out in a rural area. Or maybe she, maybe she does have a phone, but she doesn't have service. She's in an old pickup. They're in new, a new SUV or new vehicles. And then the granddaughter pops up from the back seat, having sneaked in to surprise her. Are you feeling the trigger? Have, has, has this triggered hopes and fears? A little curiosity about that? A little anxiety? Is it triggering an anticipation for something dramatic? Is there some mystery? It has for me. Okay, That is the power of the story setup. That's the engine that's going to run your car. Now. We can take this another step, and as authors, if we take it and put it into the setup summary, it will even clarify what's at the core of the story even better for us. It's very helpful as an author. Yeah, you can use it later in book descriptions and that type of thing, but but uh, at this point, we're talking about developing plots, and boy, this thing just crystallizes, clarifies. So let me tell you what the setup summary is. So you just basically fill in the blanks. In this, and then you enter in your genre, you know, the name of the character is a, you give them some adjectives or a vocation so that we know what they are, the, the type of person they are. And they're working for some hope or dream, right? This is their life before. And then a Tom enters, and then we set, state the goal, will she be able to? And then we say when she must, and then we talk about the struggle against this formidable obstacle or this series of obstacles. So let's see it for Grandma Kickbutt, right? In this action thriller, Roxy is a mid-60s gun-toting, tractor-driving, horse-riding, tough-as-nails widow rancher who loves spending time with her 10-year-old granddaughter. When she interrupts a drug cartel killing, the bad guys come after her. Will she be able to escape them when she's outmanned, outgunned, cut off in the middle of nowhere with her granddaughter and more of the cartel roadblocks? Her exit clarifying gets right down to the essence of what this 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 plot is about now you might say well maybe my story has more than just this external plot maybe there's other plots going on right there's a romance or there's a a buddy story with the granddaughter and she's trying to um get back into good graces with the granddaughter or who knows what other story well yeah yeah a novel usually has it has at least one but Usually often it has two or three. So you've got an A story, a B story, a C story. And guess what? Each one of those stories has this. Whatever story you're telling, you're trying to trigger, build, and deliver. And so each one of those is going to have a story set up. Let's look at another one with Roxy. She's too good of a character to have her in just one. She can star in a lot of stories. Here we go. Genre, heroic fantasy. Female, Roxy, 60s, washed out from mage training, but knows some small magics and just wants to see her granddaughter grow. She's off in this little little veil, right? A little teeny community in a veil. People begin vanishing from the veil. And then they find evidence of a Korog, some ancient shadowy monster, is dragging them away. Have we got a threat? Have we got a mystery maybe, right? 
Are we anticipating some some drama? We have some hopes and fears. We got a little bit, but we got we need a little bit more to really set that hook. Well, her concrete goal is I need to destroy the Korog. I need to save the people, especially my granddaughter, right? That's that's her goal. But is she going to be able to do this? Korogs are dark, shadowy, and powerful. And when this little veil sends their best warriors to go outside for help, the Korog slaughters them all. So now she's trapped in the veil with this, you know, group of misfits maybe. And they've got to, they've got to take care of it. Is she going to be able to do it? Here it is in the brief, right, in the summary. In this heroic fantasy, Roxy is a mid-60s body grandmother who wants nothing more than to enjoy her granddaughter. Boy, I like this girl, right? And then people begin vanishing from the veil. Will she be able to save her village and granddaughter when the three breast warriors have been killed and they discover that they're up against a Korog, a dark, shadowy, and powerful killer, and there's no way out of the veil? This isn't the full story. There are going to be all sorts of things that we're going to develop in this story, right? There might be backstory that's coming to haunt her. There might be all sorts of things that happen, but this is the setup. This is the engine. This is what gets you going. This is when, once you get these five elements together, this is when it starts bucking and kicking, and you're like, man, this thing wants to get out on the open road, right? That's what the story setup does for you. Let's do one more. Grandma Monster Hunter, Contemporary Fantasy. Female, Roxy, 60s, trailer park grandma who used to ride with a motorcycle gang. She's just trying to live in peace and raise her granddaughter to be a good woman who doesn't make the mistakes grandma did. You like her? I love her, right? I think she's great. Her granddaughter starts seeing dark beings before people are attacked. We want to find out. We've got this mystery here, right? Find out what the creatures are and stop them. Maybe they're killing the people. So there's a little bit of a threat, a little bit of a mystery. Roxy has no idea what's going on or who might know what's going on. Doctors diagnose the girl with a mental illness. And maybe the uh, uh, DFS is giving her crap, threatening to take her daughter away. And then the dark creatures begin to stalk her granddaughter. Boom! Have I triggered hopes and fears for this woman and her granddaughter? For me, yeah. Have I triggered anticipation that we might be able to to enjoy some dramatic things? You bet. Is there a mystery? You bet, right? Trigger. And now the plot is all about building and delivery. That is the power of the story setup, okay? Let's look at it in summary. In this contemporary fantasy, Roxy is a mid-60s ex-biker trailer park grandma who's trying to raise her granddaughter. When her granddaughter begins seeing dark beings, she's diagnosed with a mental illness. But then Roxy finds evidence the creatures are real and are killing people. Will she be able to stop the creatures when DFS wants to take the child away and then the creatures begin to hunt her granddaughter? Now, when it comes time to write the description for the book, you know, you'll go back over the book and things will change as you go along and and you'll revisit this and tighten it up. This is a working document. This summary is a working uh, tool for you as the author. To help clarify in your mind, this is what the story is about. This is the main thing that this story is about. Yes, I might have a B story, a C story, a D story. That's fine. Each one of those will have that. And once they have that, you trigger that story, and then you know what you need to build. So the bottom line is, if you're going to take people on a ride, right, the story is about a guided experience. core part of that experience is you need to trigger three things that we've talked about, hopes and fears for the characters, anticipation for something dramatic, curiosity and some mystery, right? We're going to build it to a sharp point, and then we're going to deliver. That is fundamental to commercial fiction today. If you're going to trigger that, you've got to have the story set up. That's the tool. That's the tool that's going to clarify things in your mind. Now, you can change it as you go along, as you you might get other ideas, et cetera, and expand it and tweak it. Uh, That's fine. It's not set in stone. But you got to have a story set up. Otherwise, what I've found is that you'll write a little bit and you run into a dead end. You run out of gas. You run into a tangle. You have no idea where you're going because you don't, right? You don't have the Tom. You don't have the compelling character. You don't have the goal. You don't have the obstacles. And that's what triggers all of these things that we want to trigger in the reader. Okay, part four. I got a car. Where am I going? Well, the next part of this framework is plot patterns. 
I'm not talking about the three, four, five, seven, nine act plot structures or the hero's journey or anything like that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about plot patterns and it relates directly to the story setup. So l let's say that uh, we have this, um, this, uh, this war scenario and you know we're about to be overrun and we decide, well, what we've got to do is have a team sneak in behind enemy lines and destroy this installation. That's what we've got to do, right? That, that's the story. That's the Tom. That's the goal. Well, I'm going to have a certain set of actions, steps that I take to do that, right? I'm going to, I'm going to do some uh, reconnaissance and get some intelligence about the place. And then we're going to get, do some training. We've got to form a team. We might, uh, we might need to do some other, other practicing. We might need to contact people in country. I then need to get to a place where I can insert myself into that enemy country. I've got to get across the border. I might meet some people there that are spies. I've got to get to the location. We've got to do the deed. And then we've got to reverse all that. We got to, I got to get out, right? I got to get out. That's one set of steps. That's a pattern for solving that problem, for achieving that task, okay? If I've got another story, and I, I've got this main character, he's a male, and he sees this, this super attractive woman uh, for whatever. He's physically attractive, you know, personality-wise. She's just kind, whatever it is, right? He's just attracted to that woman, but she's way above. She's way out of his social class. But he decides, I'm going to woo her. I'm going to woo that woman, okay? <laughs> he's not going to do the steps that you take to, to sneak behind enemy lines and destroy an installation. The wooing steps are very different, okay? And and then I've got yet another plot pattern for that murder mystery. The woman underneath the bridge missing a shoe. I don't do what I do for either of those things. I'm going to look around for clues and see what evidence I can find and figure out if we can figure out who that woman is. There, there are a certain set of steps that I take to solve that problem. That's what I'm talking about here, Okay. That's what I'm talking about here. It's like a map. I'm up in Butte, Montana, and I want to get down to Disneyland. And the map says, this is, this is in general, these are the legs of the journey. This is where you're headed. And if I want to go from New York to London, that's a different map. It's a different pattern. I kind of like these maps that Google gives you because you have some alternatives. There's not just one pattern. There's not just one pattern for a robbery or a heist. Not just one pattern for a romance. Not just one pattern for any of these stories. Right there, there, there are plot patterns. And by the way, that this thing in Cards Boot Camp, that that door that opened, guess what? This was it. I had one little plot pattern, one little baby plot pattern for the type of story that I had, and I said, I'm just going to try to apply this. I was stumbling around. I didn't know what I was doing. Right? I applied it, and that's when suddenly it went boom, 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 boom. Scene, 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 end. And all I needed to do was write it. I'm not saying that'll always happen with you. But boy, you, you start seeing a number of scenes. Instead of it being one or two scenes of the 30, 40, 50, 60 that you need, you start to see a bunch. But we're not done yet. Now, I want to just reemphasize something here. This is not the three, four, five, seven, or nine act structure. It's not the hero's journey. It's not the Lester Dent miracle plot generator. It's nothing like that. Those things have never been that helpful to me. They're okay way, way, way at a super high level, but they have never produced in me 30, 40, 50, 60 scenes. They haven't. Pinch points, plot points, mid-act, mid-story reversals, all of those things. You know, I, I've gotten two, three, maybe four scenes out of that. I need 30 to 60. OK, so if you if you like those and you found those interesting and I think there are some valid uh, things in them, of course there are. But it's so abstract. I put it way back up on level one of the type of experience. And I say, how can these things inform me about the type of experience that I want to give to my readers? OK, that, that's how I look at that. And then I forget them because really down in the details, down where we're working, I'm looking at a plot pattern. Now, the other thing that I want to say here is I, I use the, the, the word plot on purpose. I'm not talking just about solving a story in just any old way. I'm not talking about Frodo scampering across the road and tossing the ring in the blacksmith's forge. And then, boop, we're done, right? 
we have an experience to deliver to the reader. And so that's why I use the word plot there, because we can solve these problems, we can reach these goals in all sorts of different ways. And in real life, you know, maybe we could solve it just like that. But that's not the experience that the reader is coming to us for. And so we're talking about the uh, a plot pattern that 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 get that triggers and then builds this thing to a sharp point and then delivers. That's what I'm looking for. Okay. That's what I'm looking for. Now you may say, well, what are these plot patterns? Is there, is there a place that has these? I haven't found one. Yeah. Save the cat. The book, save the cat has some of the really high level. Yeah. There's a book called like 20 master plots and it has something, but it's still high level and it doesn't cover all of the variety, right? I have, there's a ton of military uh, espionage type of problems that I'm trying to solve. And there are certain steps in each one of them. I don't get that out of 20 plot. There are hundreds. There are hundreds of these things. So you don't need to master them all. You just need to look at what you're writing and say, what are some patterns for solving this type of problem? How do people in real life go about doing that? If I need to solve a murder mystery, how do cops and detectives and FBI agents, how do they actually do that? What are the steps they go through? Okay, that's how it's done in real life. How could I, you know, get a pattern then out of that for a plot? That's what you're looking for here. Now, we're not done yet. This is still a map. This is still kind of high level. That's a map. It's not telling you what it's like when you go through Pocatella or Twin Falls or Salt Lake City or whatever. It's, we're not down to that detail yet, but that's the next part of the framework. Let's get to that. This is the, the final part of the framework. This is what I call the action-reaction cycle, okay? The action-reaction cycle. Here's how it works. Uh, let's just go back to Roxy and those drug dealers and her neighbor and the dog and, the, and her calves, okay? There she is at the sink, making pies with Julie, just having a great time with her granddaughter. She sees something out of the kitchen window. She gets the binoculars, glasses, the field, and she's and, and at that point in time, she sees the dogs taking down her calf, right? There's money that she's losing there. It's stressing all the other cattle out. She's already talked to the neighbor about this twice. And what happens? She has a reaction. There's emotion. I've had it. That's it, right? That's what she's thinking. Now, there might follow on right after that some thought and discussion. And sometimes we relay that to the, um, to the reader. And then she comes to a decision. This is the reaction phase. And in this situation, she just decides that's it. I'm going over. And he's going to put that dog down or I will. And if she, he won't let me, then we're calling the cops because I'm done with this, right? Her goal now is to get her him to put those dogs down. So now this goes to action. She's going to take action. She has that concrete goal. That's what the decision was about. That's the tie from reaction to action. We make a decision to do something, and now we carry that over to the action, and that's our concrete goal. I'm going to not solve the problem, quote unquote. That's too abstract. It's I'm driving over to the neighbors and I'm going to get him to put those dogs down. She goes, takes the action. There are obstacles, there are surprises. All right. And then there's some result. So here we go. Rosie turns to Julie and says, hey, honey, I want you to hang out with Robbie for a little bit. Grandma's got to go talk to the neighbor. I'll be right back. And she goes to the closet, gets her gun, her rifle, takes it, gets into the pickup puts it up in the back, and then she remembers she forgot her keys. She goes back in, gets her keys, come backs out, comes back out, right, starts the pickup, goes over down to the neighbors. Now, this is the country, so maybe a mile, two miles away, whatever it is. Goes down to the neighbor, uh, the neighbor's house property, drives down the driveway. When she finally gets to the house, she sees all these other ritzy-looking cars, and she's just like, whatever. She parks. She said, I'm, I'm not turning away. I don't care if he's having a party or whatever this is going to happen now. We're done with this. So she goes through the, um, you know, past the lawn, opens up this little waist high chain link fence, goes up to the porch, knocks, nothing. Right. She's taking the action to get the, the result that she wants. Right. Knocks again. And now she hears like a, an oof or, or something from around back. And she thinks, well, he's having a party around back. That's fine. He's inconvenienced me. I'm going to inconvenience him. She goes around the house Starts walking back. She hears voices, right? She's preparing what she's going to say. She comes around the corner. And there she sees all of these rough-looking guys, maybe a rough-looking woman among them. 
One dude's holding uh, her neighbor by the hair. He's on his knees. His face is bloody. Blood is running out of his nose. His eye is swollen shut. And the guy's got a gun to his head. So she comes around the corner, and they all look up. And the dude with the gun says to the other, the guys on either side of him, get her. Okay. She took this action. She had this concrete goal. I want those dogs put down. This is it, right? She takes the action. There are some obstacles. There's a surprise. And now I have this result. But it's not the result she wanted. I we We are trying to build a plot. We're trying to build an experience. So we can't have resolution right now. We have to have some non-resolution. And there are five flavors of this. Let me give them to you. One is no. No, you tried to you tried to find leads and there were no leads. It didn't pan out. It was a dead end. No, you didn't find uh, who the murderer was, but you did find some leads, right? And that moves us forward. And, and now we can have a reaction to that, decide what to do and take action. Oh, uh, I found this lead. I'm going to go talk to this person and see what they can tell me. And off we go to action again. Or you might get this one. No, furthermore, this is the one that Roxy just had. Not only did you not get him to put those dogs down, but furthermore, you got those rough characters coming after you, right? Now things are even worse. There is another flavor, which is yes. Yes, you did the thing, but there's another problem. So, for example, with that get behind enemy lines one, yes, you made it across the border, but now you've alerted the country that you're there in, in country and everybody's looking for you. So it's, it's still terrible, right? Or there might be a simple guess, a, a little sub-step. Um, uh, and so, for example, let's go back to that one where they're trying to sneak across the border. Instead of alerting everybody, uh, maybe they got across, they got, they got past whatever border patrol was there, and they got across. And, and it was, it was uh, nip and tuck, but they did it. Well, we're still not done. They still have to get the installation. They still have to blow it up. They still have to get out, right? And so the reader is still engaged. We're still building to that climax, that delivery of our hopes and fears for that, uh, for those characters, okay? Reaction, action, and then result. These are the key parts of this. Now, let me put it into another diagram for you, and we'll just continue with Roxy as an example, okay? Here's the, the action-reaction cycle, just written a different way. I've got a compelling character. I've got Roxy, right? There she is with her situation. She sees the dogs out in the field. She glasses them. And notice down at the bottom, I've got these two words, resonates and stakes. The stakes have got to be high enough that the reader will care about it. It's not just about what happened with the character and whether the character will care about it. The reader has to care about it, Okay. And it has to be something, an issue that will resonate with the reader. That's why your, your little kids might read about fairy princesses, a story about a fairy princess, and you're like, meh, oh, maybe you love it, right? But sometimes you might think, yeah, they're, nah, I'm really not into that story. It just doesn't resonate with me. And there might be stories that you love that your little kid is just like, yeah, that doesn't resonate with me, okay? So whoever your target audience is, you want a situation that resonates. Then we have a reaction, Right? Roxy feels that emotion at seeing another one of her calves being brutalized and killed and the throat torn out, et cetera. She has a, a thought. She makes a decision. And I want you to notice out on the right-hand side of this. This is where the character comes in. How would this character react? What, is, what would be the natural response for this character? You know, people like to say, well, plot versus character. Is your story plot-driven or character-driven? I, I don't understand that. It all needs to be character driven. The plot is about the character. How would this specific character react? And you know you're done with your reaction when you can answer the question, what are we going to do now? As soon as you answer, and that could take two seconds, it could take two weeks, two months, right? You could write it in narrative detail, blow by blow by blow, or you could do it in summary. Whatever, when, once I know what we're gonna do now, that's where we go to the next phase. That's the action. I've got my concrete goal, I take my action, there are obstacles and surprise, there's a result, and we know we're done with this when we can answer the question, did we succeed? Did we achieve this little goal that we had? Notice here as well, how would this character pursue the goal? What tactics would this character use? 
if I had a spy novel and I have a super, super spy, right. That used to be in the military and he's 30 years old and he's male and he's, and he's got pecs and, and, and a six pack and, and guns that are just iron hard. Right. Well, he would approach things. He would have a certain type of reaction and take certain actions that are totally different than if the spy was a little old granny. And they would take totally different or have different, totally different reactions and actions than if the, the spy was a 16 year old girl. Right. So your character drives all of this. And you're thinking, how would my character, how would they react in this situation? How would they normally react? And you can try things on um, and surprise yourself sometimes. And then that's who, who your character becomes. Okay. You can do those kinds of things, but still you're thinking about this from your character's point of view. Now we've already talked about this. You can't have a resolution. If you have the resolution, that story's over. What we want is we want a trigger, we want it to build, and then we want to deliver. And yeah, there are some, the A story is going to start right at the beginning, and it's going to span the whole novel. The B story might be a shorter period of time. That's fine. The C story might even be shorter. That's fine. We still have a little bit of a trigger and a build and a deliver. Okay? We still need that build in there. So we're not going to have a rev resolution immediately. Instead, we're going to get the non-resolution, which we already talked about. And these are logical but unexpected. We want a little bit of surprise. Now, there's one last element that goes in this. Right in the middle, we have these three things. This is the electricity that powers the dynamo of the action-reaction cycle. Triggers that we've talked about, which start with that story setup. Obstacles, formidable obstacles, and surprise. We can have surprise. We can have all of those things in the reaction. We can have them in the action. We can introduce surprise, et cetera, in the non-resolution, right? And as soon as we have that, it kicks over to reaction. So I've got, I've got the situation. I have a reaction. I take action. There's a result. I've still got a situation, right? And now it might be worse. It might be more problematic, whatever. I, I now have a reaction. And then I take action. And then I have a non-resolution result, et cetera. And I go around and around and around until I built it to a sharp point, and then I release. That's the action-reaction cycle. These things are going to help you. They're going to make plotting so much easier, okay? Let's just review what they are. Let's review all five of them. Story is a guided experience. We're thinking about genre, remember? It's like an amusement park ride, etc. but we're thinking about genre. Then we're going to trigger, build, and deliver. It's like those sports games that are awesome, okay? And, and Trigger, build, deliver is a fundamental part of that experience. It determines what, where the story starts, where it stops, what happens in between. It's not everything that happens in the story. It's not everything we go to story for, but boy, it is a big part of it. The way that we trigger is with the story setup. That's the engine in your story car. That's going to get you down the road, let you get out onto the road, actually, and start making progress. In order to figure out where you need to go, the best tool that I have ever found are these plot patterns. That is not the three, four, five, seven, or nine act plot structure. It's not the hero's journey. It's not Lester Dent's miracle plot. It's none of that. It's a plot pattern for this is the type of goal, the type of Tom I have. How do we normally go about solving that? And how do we do it in a plot way that delivers the experience we're talking about? And then finally, we have the action reaction cycle. That is the John Brown story framework. Those five things will get you down the road. You know, we talk about 80-20 rule. A little, uh, you know, 20% of the things have 80% of the results. This is it. This is what I found in my writing. These are the core things. And from this framework, you can hang on all sorts of other things about story, how you do dialogue, right? How you uh, transport readers and make sure that the writing is vivid and clear, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But this, for me, is the core. Now, you might be thinking, oh, wow, okay, there's a lot of stuff. How do I learn this? How do I incorporate this? And the way that you're going to do that is you're going to recognize it in other works. That's how we learn everything. That's how we do creativity. We see it in somebody else. You see somebody else do it, and then we start improvising our versions of that, right? That's what we do. So, so the first thing you want to do is start to be able to see this, to sensitize yourself to it, 
And so what I want to uh, suggest that you do is look at the stories that, that you're currently consuming and ask yourself these, these five questions. These five questions. What makes this type of experience cool? Why do I come to this? Why do I want this kind of experience? What are the key things that are making this awesome? What triggers, builds, and delivers? I need to get down into the details and figure out how did they trigger hope, that hope and fear? How did they just build that and twist the screw? How did they uh, trigger mystery? You're going to find that it's not as difficult as you think. What makes characters, Tom's goals, and obstacles compelling? That's what you're looking for, okay? What are some plot patterns for this story that I've got? There are hundreds, thousands of things that people might want to accomplish. You just want to look at the ones. You don't have to master them. You want to look at the ones that you're looking at now, okay, for your story. And then how does the AR, the, the action reaction cycle, work in plots that I love? If you will focus your study on this, I, I, I promise you, it's going to deliver mega results. And as you start seeing this in other stories, you'll be able to then improvise for yourself. Take that and say, ooh, I want to kind of do that same thing, but maybe I'll do it a little bit different, okay? That's how this works. Now, there are some books that can help you. You still have to go do your study on your own, but there are some books that can help you. I wrote Create Story Ideas That Beg to Be Written because I didn't see anywhere, anybody that talked with clarity about the first three things in the frame, framework, trigger, build, deliver, and the story setup. I just, that's why I wrote the book. That's a whole book about that to help you get insight, okay? Down about the action reaction cycle. The, this scene and structure is the book that I read and then applied, and that next story is the one that won the first prize in the Writers of the Future contest. So, I, and I have a hard time. I like both of these books by Jack Bickham. He published 80 novels, had a couple of them made into movies. He's great. Both of these are great. You can get one or the other or both, okay? But it's going to help you with the action reaction cycle. I want to warn you right here. He uses the term scene and sequel, and it drives me bonkers because those terms mean something else, okay? So when you get to it, let me just give you a hint separate the concepts that he's trying that is all, that are all jumbled up there there's narrative summary and there's narrative detail that's how you're tell, telling the story narrative summary means it takes less time to tell it than it actually took to happen i live up at the south end of bear lake if i say i drove to salt lake city that took me a second it takes two and a half hours to get there that's narrative summary narrative detail is i'm telling it and it takes about as long to tell it as it does for the whole thing to unfold. I pick up my keys. I click the button on my computer to turn it off. I stand up. I head for the stairs. I grab the stair rail. I go up the stairs, right? That's narrative detail. And I could even take a little bit longer than it takes to unfold. Narrative summary, narrative detail. And then you have action, reaction. Just split his scene and sequel apart into those things. I think it'll make it more clear for you. And then the final is Techniques of the Selling Writer by Dwight V. Swain. Swain was actually Bickham's teacher, but he goes and he has good things and helpful things, very practical things to say about um, uh, items all across that framework. Okay, folks, I've opened up the door for you. I hope you found it helpful. I hope you're able to go out and take this and then I wish you all the success in the world in creating exciting plots. You don't need to think that you don't have the DNA or don't have the personality type or don't have the smarts or don't have the gift or whatever it is. You're a human. You are built for story. It is wired into your cells. The, the, the machine is already on and turned on upstairs, right? It's there. You can do this. And I just wish you all the success in the world.